Good morning from Stony Creek United Methodist Church. Uh, it's good to see the people that are here in the sanctuary with me. And I'll speak directly to all of you that are celebrating with us this morning via Facebook. Um, if you've printed out your bulletin, you're seeing that things are a little different. Uh, I wish all of you a happy Labor Day. And for me, I was raised in a generation where you can't wear white after Labor Day. So I got one final Sunday out of my white pants. <laughs> and I'm being told that that tradition doesn't hold. Oh, it's garbage. Okay, got it. <laughs> I still wore my white pants one final time. Um, those of you that are celebrating with me here in the sanctuary, you've already got a list of upcoming activities, so you can kind of follow along. There's a couple that we need to highlight. Um, first of all, the chairman of our outreach committee is having a well-deserved vacation. So we all say, hi, Barb. Hope you're having a good time. Um, Stony Creek may be little, but we're mighty. And our September schedule pretty well shows that. Um, one of the big dates coming up is September 16th. We will be having our treasure mark, yard sale, whatever you want to. We've got a lot of things, and if there's people out there that want to contribute, you're welcome. We're going to be here on Saturday, the 16th. Um, there are some sign-up sheets in the back because all of these treasures will not get sorted and priced by themselves. So if you have some time, we're going to start set up the week before the 16th. So check and see if there's a convenient time that you can come over and help. Uh, along with the treasure sale will be a bake sale. There's also uh, sign up sheet for helping with the bake sale, uh, pricing. If you have any questions at all, uh, contact Charlene Hall. She's in charge of the bake sale. So keep in. So now we've gotten to the 16th, and the next day is also a very important day. We start our Sunday school. And we're hoping to have enough teachers so we can have two small classes, the littler kids and then a class for the little bit more mature, like the fourth, fifth graders that you know don't want to be with the little ones. We can still use Sunday school teachers. And being Methodists, we have a sign-up sheet for that. So be sure and Check your sign-up sheets. So now we've gotten through to the 16th. On Wednesday the 27th, we're going to meet as a group, travel to Cracker Barrel up on, I believe it's the Belleville exit is the one we're going to. And we're going to be having our lunch. We try to do this once a month and so this day is Wednesday the 25th, no, 27th, and it will be at the Cracker Barrel. And then we're going to close September out by having a potluck on Saturday, September 30th. It'll be a campfire hot dog roast potluck, and you'll probably get more details on that couple other communications that Barb left for me were we are still selling books in the fellowship hall and there's paperbacks, hardcovers, every reading level and there's a little can for 
donations, and then that will go in with uh, yard sale receipts. Um, kids club starts Sunday, we've mentioned that. So we welcome teachers, but we also welcome kids of all ages. And some might be teachers and some might be students. Uh, and then on a final note, um, since our pastor's still on vacation, we will not be having communion this morning. But next Sunday, which I believe is the 10th, we will be having communion. So uh, that's the end of the announcements that Barb left for me. Does anyone else have an announcement that they want to share? Okay. Well, this time then I invite you to turn your attention to the uh, bulletin where our songs are listed. Uh, kind of looks like you don't need your red hymnals this Sunday. We'll be doing all of our songs either from the uh, fellowship folder, which looks like this, or one of our supplemental hymnals, Worship and Song. That's the green one, well, right? Let's use the black one. It's, actually it's the, the black, black one. one. That's okay. That's okay. They, they won't kick me out. Okay, you need the black one. Just make sure you're near a black folder. Okay, and at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Teresa, who's the leader of our praise band, and she will give us the sort of songs. And we're always keeping Fonda. We have no quarrel with her. So just as she said, pull out a red folder near you in the pew, we're going to stand together, if you're able, for the first song, number 28, Clap Your Hands. This will be a peppy one, so hold on. We'll sing it three times. Then we'll be seated for the second song, Blessed Quietness. Blessed Quietness is in your black hymnal. So pull out both of those, and we'll start with Clap Your Hands. You may be seated. <laughs> Blessed quietness, verses one, two, four, and five.
continuing our worship, I invite you to recite with me our opening prayer. It's printed in your bulletin. Lord of the harvest, we give you great thanks for all the work that has been done to make our lives possible. For those who work the fields of the earth to provide us with food. For those who work in factories to provide us with clothes and so many other necessities, we give you thanks. For those whose work enables us to think deeply, act justly, and worship truly, we lift our prayers. For all who work with their hands, their minds, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would imbue them with a sense of meaning and purpose, recognizing that all work done faithfully it's done for the glory of God. Amen. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. And so in faith and with assurance, we bring our offerings this morning. We hope in a generous God who meets our needs. We hope in a creative God who multiplies our gifts. We hope in a mysterious God who invites us to kingdom living. God of grace, accept these gifts and us in your service, amen.
please rise as you are able and join me in the doxology. St. Paul wrote, if I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. At this time, I invite all that are with us on Facebook or here in the sanctuary to recite together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The next part of our worship service this morning is the hymn, uh, Bringing in the Sheaves. It's an attachment to your bulletin. And again, I invite you, if you are comfortable and able to stand as we sing, Bringing in the Sheaves.
seated. Okay, at this time, we welcome anybody's joys and concerns. Uh, I have a few, but I'd like to wait and hear from you first. Anybody have a joy or concern they want to share? Uh, we've had a very busy week at our house. We are all moved out, not unpacked, but all moved out. Um, and if you could pray for my little dog, Pickle, she's having a really hard time with this change. Is there anybody else? I have to share a concern I had had for a few minutes this morning. Laurel and Leon are so regular in attending, even through all of their hardships, and they didn't get here until late, and I thought something was wrong. Uh, you two doing okay? House getting fixed? No. Uh, we keep you in our prayers. Um, a couple others that I know of, um, Barb McCarwich last week shared that her husband Dan had tried to play football with Connor, their about 10 year old son. Well, sure enough, Dan is moving gingerly now because uh, he cracked some ribs. So let's keep Dan McCarwich. I have not heard a recent update on Sandy Scalise. Has anyone else? The last I know for sure, um, when I was in the hospital Tuesday with my son having his hip surgery, uh, I saw Jim in the cafeteria and he reported Sandy was having a procedure, they're trying to get her heart, uh, I think she's in AFib, and they're working with medications and different procedures. So since Jim and Sandy are not here, I, I know that they both are in need of uh, supportive prayers. Another member of our church, Joyce Hennon, has recently been in the hospital uh, they're trying to determine exactly what are her medical problems and how they can be addressed, and she might end up needing to go in rehab. So, uh, and along with Joyce, I ask for supportive prayers for her partner, Linda, having someone you love not feel well is hard on our our respect of other persons, so. And I did say that my son had his surgery Tuesday, came through it, first uh, 12 hours were fine because the epidural was still in place. The next 24 hours were a little questionable because the epidural had worn off. And, um, but I know he's making progress he's now sleeping through the night and he's gotten the painkillers down so for that I praise the Lord thank you at this time I'd like for you to turn to page 2164 and this will be our invitation to prayer this will set us into a prayerful mood and then you will notice that today we will be doing the morning prayer. I will lead, and then as it's printed in the bulletin, uh, I ask the people here in the sanctuary and at home to respond with me. Page 2164, Sanctuary.
the morning prayer litany is printed in the bulletin. God, in the spirit revealed in Jesus Christ, calls us by grace to be renewed in the image of our creator, that we may be one in divine love for the world. Today is the day God cares for the integrity of creation, wills the healing and wholeness of all life, weeps at the plunder of the earth's goodness, and so shall we. Today is the day God embraces all hues of humanity, delights in diversity and difference, favors solidarity, transforming strangers into friends. And so shall we. Today is the day God cries with the masses of starving people, despises growing disparity between rich and poor, demands justice for workers in the marketplace, and so shall we. Today is the day God deplores violence in our homes and streets, rebukes the world's warring madness, humbles the powerful, and lifts up the lowly. And so shall we. Today is the day God brings good news to the poor, proclaims release to the captives, gives sight to the blind, and sets the oppressed free. And so shall we. Amen. We will continue reading together our prayer of illumination. May our hearts and minds be like the young boy Samuel, who didn't know the Lord yet, earnestly waited to hear your word. Speak to us, O Lord, through the power of the Holy Spirit, for your servants are listening. Amen. going to have the beginning, our first three scriptures this morning. Uh, I'll be reading from a form that's called the Hands-On Bible. So the words may, cor may not correspond with the phrases in the pew Bibles or the Bibles that you might be using at home. Our first scripture reading comes from Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 to 3. So the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all of his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all of his work of creation. The second comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 8 to 11. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. 
but on the seventh day he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. Our next reading comes from the New Testament, the book of Mark, chapter 2, verses 23 to 28. One Sabbath day, as Jesus was walking through some grain fields, his disciples began breaking off heads of grain to eat. But the Pharisees said to Jesus, why are they breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? Jesus said to him, haven't you read the scriptures where David, when he and his companions were hungry, he went into the house of God during the days when Erehob was high priest and broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that only the priests are allowed to eat. He also gave some to his companions. And then Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. Thus ends the reading of the Word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. This time, I invite you again, we're in the Black Hymnal, uh, Faith We Worship, page 2234, Lead On, O Cloud of Presence, 2234. Stand if you feel comfortable and are able. next two scripture readings will be found in the book of Jeremiah and the book of James. Jeremiah chapter 22 verses 13 to 14. And the Lord says, 
What sorrow awaits your beacon, who builds his palace with forced labor. He builds injustice into its walls, for he makes his neighbors work for nothing. He does not pay them for their labor. He says, I will build a magnificent palace with huge rooms and many windows, and I will panel it throughout with fragrance and cedar and paint in a lovely red. That was from the book of Jeremiah. Now reading from Mark chapter 2, verses 23 to 28. Excuse me, reading from verses 1 through 6. This is called a warning to the rich. Look here, you rich people. Weep and groan with anguish because of all the terrible troubles ahead of you. Your wealth is rotting away and your fine clothes are moth-written rags. Your gold and silver have become worthless. The very wealth you were count counting on will eat away your flesh like fire. This is really heavy stuff. This treasure you have accumulated will stand as evidence against you. It will stand against you the day of judgment. For listen, hear the cries of the field workers whom you have cheated for their pay. The wages you held back cry out against you. The cries of those who harvest your fields have reached the ears of the Lord of the heaven's armies. You have spent your years on earth in luxury, satisfying your every desire. You have fattened yourselves for the day of slaughter you have condemned and killed innocent people who did not resist you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. <coughs> At this time, uh, one of my fellow liturgists, Dave Monson, and our praise leader, Teresa Briefert, are going to share with you the morning message. As I said, pastor's on vacation, but he prepared a message for his people here and his people on Facebook. And so now I invite Teresa and Dave to come forward and share the message. Good morning. This weekend, our country will be celebrating Labor Day. And while the Methodist movement in America began well before Labor Day became a national holiday, there are many connections to the core belief and social focus on the Methodist movement and the attempt to organize the importance of workers in our country. Over time, this holiday for many has just become an extended weekend but there is a serious and important history to Labor Day and the events that brought it about. The U.S. Department of Labor explains the first Monday in September is created of Labor Day movement and is dedicated to the social and economic achievements of American workers. It consists of yearly national tributes to the contributions workers have made to the strength, prosperity, and well-being of our country. We recognize the beginning of the Methodist movement to be in 1730, when John and Charles Wesley, while students at Oxford University in England, 
gathered a small group of students who sought to reform the Church of England. This group of students were dedicated to a frequently attend a Holy Communion, serious study of the Bible, and regular visitations to the aristocrats and filthy Oxford prison. We need to remember that when John Wesley, along with Charles, found the Methodist movement in during the 18th century, there was no labor movement. The uh, way we understand it today, but it was Wesley who preached to and cared for the coal miners and other oppressed workers. Wesley opposed slavery, despite the fact that the Methodist Church was at one time on the wrong side of the argument. Well, it was over 160 years later, in 1894, when President Cal uh, Grover Cleveland signed the law that Congress passed designating the first Monday in September a holiday for workers that we refer to as Labor Day. Before this, Labor Day was recognized by labor activists and individual states. After municipal ordinance, ordinance were passed in 1885 and 1886, a movement developed to secure state legislatures. New York was the first state to introduce a bill, but Oregon was the first to pass law recognizing Labor Day on February 21, 1887. During 1887, four more states, Colorado, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and New York passed laws creating Labor Day holiday. By the end of the decade, Connecticut, Nebraska, and Pennsylvania had followed suit. By 1894, 23 more states had adopted the holiday. So with that much time between them, just how does Labor Day connect to the United Methodists? Well, United Methodists have been a part of labor movement throughout history and continue to be committed to fairness and justice in the workplace. In the early 20th century, the church was working to end child labor, which we may need to once again take up. The course has given some recent change in labor laws. In some states in our country, in the 1950s, during the Civil Rights Movement, the United States United Methodists were fighting for fair wages and better working conditions. This is an important part of our history and something we need to hold on to and also continue to engage with. And going back to the efforts of the early Methodist movement, we find that Wesley's word and actions had stayed power through because even after his death, Wesley's followers continued to work against workplace injustice in rapidly industrializing England and by adopting the first social creed in 1908 that special creed dealt exclusively with labor practices and justice for workers, including advocating for a living wage in every industry. These efforts continue today as it was in 2000 that the United Methodist Church adopted a resolution in support of the living wage model for the entire world. Part of the resolution state, <coughs> United Methodist Church reaffirms its historical support for the living wage movement and calls upon businesses and government to adopt policies to ensure employees are paid sufficient wages to afford shelter, food, clothing, health care, and other basic expenses. According to local cost of living, United Methodists will work in <coughs> partnership with persons, communities, and governments everywhere around the world to bring about the creation of conditions that encompass fundamental workers' rights, fair wages, a safe and healthy workplace, reasonable hours of work, decent living standards, support for community, infrastructure, and commitment to community economic development. It was then in 2008 that the resolution was adopted by the church in support of rights of workers in the first section of the resolution, we find the concerns of the United Methodist Church by, for the dignity of workers and the right of employees to act collectively. It is stated in the social principles. 
Both employers and unions are called to bargain in good faith within the framework of the public interest. In response to the increasing globalization of the economy, economic system, the winding disparity between the rich and the poor, and attempts to deprive workers of their fundamental rights, the church reform is positioned in support of workers and their right to organize. So continuing on, is the focus on these issues by the church a matter of social justice and trying to be morally correct? Or is there more to it? Are these efforts founded on faith and scripture? Well, as we've heard already this morning during Fonda's readings, yes, they are. If we go back also to the living wage model resolution adopted by the United Methodist Church in 2000, the opening paragraph reads, quote, throughout scripture, God commands us to treat workers with respect, dignity, and fairness. Exploitation or underpayment of workers is incompatible with Christ's commandment to love our neighbor. A love that extends to all persons in all places, including the workplace. The Old Testament and New Testament include explicit warnings to those who would withhold fair pay to workers. And this is from today's scripture, Jeremiah chapter 22. Woe to him working his countrymen for nothing, refusing to give them their wages. And then again from the book of James that we heard about, chapter 5, listen, hear the cries of the wages of your field hands. These are the wages you stole from those who harvested your fields. The cries of the harvesters have reached the, the ears of the Lord Almighty. Similar language and references can be found in the opening and second paragraphs of the 2008 United Methodist Rights of Workers Resolution, where we find, and I'm quoting here, human beings created in the image of God have an innate dignity. This is from Genesis 1. Commanding human beings to farm and take care of the earth, God granted dignity to the work of human hands. This is from Genesis chapters 1 and 2. Work remains a means of stewardship and God-given creativity. Throughout scripture, God orders life together based on right relationships, shared resources, and economic justice. In the very act of creation, God demonstrates time for work and time for rest. Later, the Hebrew, Hebrew prophets decried the growing disparities of wealth and poverty. The book of Acts describes an early Christian community that shared its goods with one another. So the basic principles are clear. All human beings should be treated with respect and dignity. Thus, those who work should earn wages that sustain themselves and their families. Employers have a particular responsibility to treat workers fairly and empower them to organize to improve conditions. Now, shifting to some to statistics. We live in times currently where, for example, during the first quarter, just the first three months of this calendar year, 69% of the total wealth in the United States was owned by just the top 10% of earners. Then to further highlight this divide, by comparison, the lowest 50% of workers, 50% of earners, owned only 2.4% of the total wealth. So that was 70% of total wealth owned by 10%, and then the lowest 50% of earners owning only 2.4% of total wealth. 
And this is just the disparity found between the layers of our society based on income. These numbers do not even begin to measure disparities between races or sexes or generations, levels of education obtained, other demographic groups. From 1979 to 2019, over that 40 year period, the income inequality in the United States has grown by 25%. Another example, during the pandemic, U.S. billionaires added almost $4 trillion, $4 trillion, to their collective wealth. But during that same time, labor income, that is the expected earnings of workers, lost over $3.5 trillion. So an increase, of four point, an increase of $4 trillion for billionaires and then lost earnings of $3.5 trillion in expected earnings by workers. <clears throat> While our country claims to operate in a free market system, a capitalist society, there is nothing scriptural to support the continued growth of divide that those examples tell us about. People, at least some people, are being taken advantage of. Current tax laws favor those who have more than they were, will ever be able to spend several generations down the road. And the tax laws cripple those who cannot even afford consistent shelter, food, medical care, or other necessities. There is nothing just in how things operate right now. <clears throat> we also recognize that this is not an uplifting message on a holiday weekend when many people are trying to relax and enjoy a little more time before the children go back to school and life gets busy or busier. But looking at the history and convictions of our denomination and the Methodist movement, we cannot continue to turn a blind eye to what is happening all around us and to many of us. We pray that you would take some time today or tomorrow and take all of this in and sit with it. Sit with it until it makes you uncomfortable. Sit with it until it makes you angry. Sit with it until it makes you cry. And then do something about it. Pastor Michael mentions that he will never, ever, ever tell us who we should vote for, especially from the pulpit. But he does beg us to go and do our civic duty and vote. John Wesley would and did the same thing. And as for other examples of civic duty, these don't have to be monumental things. You could attend a township commission meeting that is requesting public comment or even join a committee in our local community that needs volunteers. All of these things are reflected in the words we're going to sing in today's final hymn. We will work with each other, we will work side by side, and we'll guard human dignity and save human pride. And they'll know we are Christians by our love by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. I would say it's clear. As people of faith, we must not. We cannot separate the things we claim as part of our faith, such as the teachings of Christ, our Savior. We cannot separate that from how we treat and support each other. That goes far beyond being a hypocrite. Doing that breaks God's heart and prevents us from living out our faith authentically. And in our world today, we need authenticity, we need mercy, we need grace, and we need love. Love for our God and love for our neighbors. Amen.
Thank you very much. Uh, that message was read by two of the laity, but you can tell that it's the message of the pastor of Stony Creek United Methodist Church that he's laid down some causes for us to think about. Okay, at this time I invite you again, we're going to take um, our folder, it's page 2223, and we will stand and sing this together. As you are able, okay, page 2223, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Thank you. Announcements or anything, anyone who wants. Uh, for the benediction this morning, I will admit this is a very personal thing. But 41 years ago, I sent my sons off to college in New York. And our closing benediction at that time was God be with you till you meet again. So this year, that son sends his son off to Kalamazoo, and this grandma's finding it a little bit more hard. And so some of you may even know the tune to it, but my benediction is, God be with you till we meet again. By his counsel's guide uphold you. And his sheep securely fold you. God be with you till we meet again. <laughs>